So I'm Dr. Elizabeth Quindetting, and I am a professor of music at Wake Forest University, where I teach world music, modern popular music, and the Balinese Gamelan Ensemble. Gamelan is a type of gong chime orchestra, or you can think about it as a large percussion orchestra, from Indonesia. Um, they're related to other types of ensembles from across Southeast Asia that also use gongs and keyed metallophones, keyed metal instruments, and other percussive instruments such as drums and chimes. There are several styles that are associated with Java, the Indonesian island of Java, um, and on Bali there are as many as 40 depending on how you count. Gamelans are largely made out of metal um, in terms of the percussive instruments, often bronze, but some older styles in Bali are iron as well. But they're also gamelans made out of bamboo or other materials. And along with the different types of percussive families, there are other types of instruments in the different gamelans that are non-percussive as well. So for example, both Balinese and Javanese gamelans may have spiked fiddles called rabab. Um, they have the kendang, which are skin-headed drums. They have also suling, which are uh, bamboo flutes. I can't play this. Thinking about Javanese and Balinese gamelans, to an untrained eye, they look kind of similar. They both have large gongs. They both have smaller horizontal gongs. They both have heat instruments. Um, and in some ways, they are similar in terms of having usually a cyclical foundation, a cyclical form based on a gong cycle, um, and then having a core melody and various types of elaboration. And as well, many of these ensembles are controlled in terms of tempo or dynamics by the kendang. However, there are also plenty of differences. So for example, the Javanese gamelan has a number of gongs, both the great gong, as well as gongs according to every pitch of the gamelan. The Balinese gamelans tend to only have one or two large hanging gongs and one smaller one. So there's much less presence in terms of distinctive pitches. Um, so that's one difference. Another is in terms of types of melodic elaboration. So both have a core melody in central Japanese gamelan called balungan, or pokok and Balinese gamelan that has other instruments that elaborate upon it, and there are different ways of doing that. These two are the jagogan. They anchor the core melody. While the jagogan may have the lower part of the core melody, the churing, the smallest keyed instruments, take up the high end. You may have seen these if you tuned into my senior recital. Most of the elaboration is carried out by the instruments known as gongsa, and there are two types of gongsa, one lower and one higher. These are the lower and thus larger instruments, the gongsa pemade. In this particular set, there are four each of the pemade and the cantalon. So this is exactly like the gongsa pemade, but this, being the cantalon, is about an octave higher. The main playing technique you'll find on instruments such as these is the muting or the dampening that occurs after you hit a note. So for instance, if I play one, two, three, I don't do anything with my left hand. I'm right-handed, so I play it with my right, and I dampen with my left. When I hit the second note, I hit two. The instant that I hit the second note, I'm muting or dampening with the other hand. This is one of the big learning curves for people who are getting used to an instrument like this. But when you get really good at it, you can just fly up and down this little keyboard. Keeping time throughout all this is an instrument called the kajar, which comes from the root word to teach. But 
my personal favorite instrument to play in this whole ensemble is the rayon. Adding shimmer and color to whatever melodic and rhythmic elaborations the rayong is doing is the cheng cheng, which is onomatopoetic because, well, just listen to it. It's very loud. One of the interesting features about Bonnie's gamelan elaboration styles is that um, the way in which, one of the ways in which you elaborate the core melody is through multiple parts that interlock. And um, in that case, you also have a two-part division, generally, between polos and sangsi, as they're called, one which is thought of as being more straight or more regular, and one that is more following, they're, although they're often glossed as being more on and off the beat. The types of interlocking that are created by polos and sangsi are uh, quite variable. There are a number of different styles that you can pursue. This is one of the interesting facets of the texture, and it's something that enables gamelan musicians to play very, very fast, because they are dividing the parts rather than attempting to play a single elaboration, each person themselves. This also ties back, of course, into the cultural idea of um, dividing labor and uh, assigning labor so that you have two individuals working together to create a part rather than having one person do it themselves. And it creates both a difference in the feeling of the music, the actual sound, but also the feeling of how the ensemble is working, to have two people working together to create one elaboration. <laughs> There are certain elements also within the way that form works as well. So while each of these styles generally revolve around gong cycle and core melody, um, in Central Japanese gamelan, for example, the way the sort of time rhythmic structure is called a rama, and you can have um, formal switches and sections that are rama changes their changes to the level of rhythmic density, whereas that's not a common feature of Balanese gamelan. You have different types of formal sections that make up the form. Usually the strong beat is the first beat, but with the gong cycle, the, the great gong in a lot of Balinese music comes in at the end. Yes, absolutely. So the idea is basically that phrases are leading towards the gong. Um, of course, since if it's a cycle, then that's, you, know, you could debate that point, but um, the idea being that the feeling is that everything is moving towards the gong. And that is generally true of both Balinese and Japanese gamelan. Um, aesthetically, the sort of placement of that, the micro timing of that is somewhat different uh, to a, you know, a, an ear trained on a metronome. In particular, Javanese gongs and the arrival of the gong tends to happen a little bit late metrically. And in Bali, they tend to have it happen more directly on metronome time. There are three gongs here. The largest of this is the Great Gong, or the Gong a Gong. It's got the best sound. It's also got the name of the ensemble. So when you name an ensemble, when you christen one in a ceremony, you actually name the gong. The middle-sized gong here is poor. smaller gong down here is either called mong or tong, depending on the style. Let's play with the back of the stick. So altogether, if you were to have an 8-beat cycle, it might sound something like this. Gamelan has a paired tuning, which is actually fairly distinctive. The Javanese does not in the same way. Um, and that means that instruments are conceived of as having 
a pair or a mate. So there are two instruments that may look the same but are thought of as being a pair. And the way that they are tuned is that um, one set of, or one half of this pair is conceived of as being female, wadon, and it has a slightly lower pitch, and the upper pitched one, lanang, is male. And when the two of these instruments, this pair, plays together, you get a sort of shimmering sound called ombak, which means waves. And this is a distinctive feature of the sound, and without it, um, the gamelan sound is actually considered to be dead. So don't ever get a piano tuner trying to, uh, you know, equal temperamentize the gamelan because that would actually destroy what's uh, beautiful and what's sort of its characteristic sound. The female pitch is the being lower is associated with the earth, whereas the male um, being higher is associated with the heavens. But the important part really is that just like in Balinese society, where most of the roles of traditional society the tasks are divided between men and women, each with a role to play. You can't have a gamelan with only male or only female instruments. Um, that the sound actually requires both to be complete. And does this tie into the idea that the instruments have souls and that they are respected as having souls? So, um, I don't know of a direct tie into the idea of instruments having souls, but it's definitely true that the instruments are believed to be possessing of spirits, and that's, um, if you see people interacting with gamelan instruments, that's one of the reasons that will explain some of the behavior that you'd see, as far as um, people not stepping over the instruments, that's considered to be a sign of respect. Um, the fact that the drums, for example, in Balinese gamelan in particular, generally have baju kendang, they have clothing, like a human would have clothing, and the instruments in Balinese gamelan in particular are also generally carved and painted. And so those are aspects sort of of their external being or their external clothing, as it were. So let's get into the tuning of the gamelan here. So this is a fusion between the anklong and the gong kibyar styles. Yes. So, and having played with this group for some time, I still am not entirely sure what part is the Anklung and which part is the Gong Kibyar? Absolutely, yeah. So there are two um, overarching terms to describe tuning systems for gamelan. Slendro and Pelog. And in Javanese gamelan, this is actually interesting. So a complete set of Javanese gamelan has different instruments that are tuned to each tuning. So you'll often, you'll see them placed at um, a right angle to each other and the instrumentalists will play, sit towards one instrument to play slendro, and then if they switch to a part of a piece or a piece that's in Pelog, they will literally move their body to the other instrument. Um, Balinese gamelans tend to be one or the other, uh, traditionally. And so what, what are these tuning systems like? So slendro is a five-pitch tuning system, it's a pentatonic system, whereas Pelog has seven pitches and each of these have different names, and it depends on which configuration of instrument, or um, configuration of pitches are on each instrument as to how the individual keys, you know, you point to them and have them be named. So gamelan gankibyar, which is a type of gamelan that arrived, arose in Bali in the early 20th century, whose name really means to like flare up or flash up like a spark, um, this is a sort of newer gamelan and that's only just over 100 years old and its system is a Pelog system. So there are, of the Pelog scale of which there are seven pitches, it uses a tuning called Sai Silesir, which only is five. So um, the tones ding, dong, ding, dung, and dang, which if you were in the West you might number for convenience one, two, three, five, six. So it's leaving out pitches four and seven of seven. Now Anklung is a four or five pitch um, type of gamelan. It actually only has four or five keys. Gong kibyars are much larger. Anklung is four or five actual keys on a keyed instrument. And traditionally, they the tuning for Anklung was its own thing. It would be called Sai Anklung, as opposed to the type of tuning for Gong kibyar called Sai Silesir. Um, but over time, Anklung has 
it seems that it has moved more closely to a more standard device slendro of five pitches. So ours is an interesting gamelan because um, it is a hybrid. I believe it's the only hybrid of its type in North America. Um, it is basically what's called a gamelan kimban kirang, which is a five tone slendro in its tuning profile. But instead of only having five keys on the gangsa instruments, we actually have an extended range. So that the idea being that you can play um, Anklung repertoire in the middle of the set and just ignore the keys that wouldn't be included in a traditional Anklung instrument. But then you can also play Gong Kibyar repertoire um, that maps physically directly onto the instruments. Although you are playing it in Sendro instead of Paylog, which is a little bit confusing for experienced musicians from time to time to sort of make that aural switch. I had first played Balinese Gamon at um, a middle school band camp at Florida State when I was about 12 years old. And I it got you young. What? It got me young. <laughs> yeah. But I, the thing is, I didn't even remember this until a few years ago because um, that was sort of an afternoon elective and you could do, I think another time I did uh, music theory class, or I know I did steel band one time. Um, so they had these enrichment electives for band and orchestra and choral kids to do as part of summer camp. I completely forgot about it basically until I went to college and got interested in ethnomusicology. And I only began to play as a grad student when I came back to Florida State. And um, it stuck with me not from the initial time that I played with it, oddly, because there are so many different and fabulous types of ensembles to join there. But it was the combination of starting to also study dance that I began to really think more critically about the music to understand its structure better. Um, and then also the dancer that I was working with just happened to think to bring her dance costumes and happened to get connected with this ensemble and was doing it basically you know, to make some extra money or, and or as a hobby. I'd also been pursuing in a degree in ethnomusicology. Uh, I've been reading a number of our required readings and realized that Gamelan had basically traveled alongside the development of that scholarly discipline since its beginnings in the United States, since its modern existence as a discipline. And I found that to be absolutely fascinating. Um, why were these instruments here? Where did they come from? What relationship did gamelans like the one I was playing in have to gamelans in Indonesia? And so ultimately that led me to start traveling to Indonesia. And end up writing a book that's still in progress about the history of American gamelan. Yes, yeah, so I have um, a book that I hope will be uh, on our shelves soon that's about Balinese gamelan and higher education, and it follows closely the um, life and work of one family, the Tonkis family, with whom I have worked now for almost an entire decade, and who's worked with a number of my students as well, as they developed um, a set of academic and community gamelans in the front range of the Rocky Mountains but it draws on other perspectives from a number of Americans and Balinese people who are teachers and musicians and scholars who are bringing gamelan to a transnational audience.